Today we're going to be learning how to import an image sequence into Blender and then 3D motion track it to be used in 3D compositing. Welcome to part two of this Blender tutorial series about 3D compositing. Uh, today we're going to be importing the image sequence we created in the last episode into Blender and motion tracking it. Now motion tracking is a process in which we can uh, calculate the motion of a camera on a shot and use that to know how to move a virtual camera in 3D space to properly composite 3D models. It'll make more sense once you see it. It kind of sounds weird when you talk about it. Now, there are a lot of different methods of doing this. Uh, Blender uses a point tracking system, which basically means we will uh, 2D track a bunch of little points all throughout our image and then use that to calculate a 3D camera solve. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. It will all make sense once you see it in action. All right, go ahead and launch Blender, and we're gonna leave everything exactly how it is here. And before we do anything, we're gonna go ahead and save our project file. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit save, name the file, and save that in the same project folder that you created in the last episode. All right, now that that's done, we're going to go ahead and enter the uh, VFX motion tracking workspace, which is uh, up here on the right. Go ahead and hit the plus, go to VFX and choose, that's right, motion tracking. All right, now this looks really confusing, um, but believe it or not, we will be using most of everything here. We won't be using the 3D viewfinder right now. So to go ahead and collapse a window, you can go up and um, go in the corner here between two windows where they all intersect and you'll see a sort of cross here. If you start on the left side and then drag to the right, you'll get this arrow and you can go ahead and collapse this window. But most everything else here we'll be using. So I'm gonna go ahead and just resize my main window here. And now we need to go ahead and open that image sequence which we created last episode. So go ahead and click open on the top, navigate to the folder with your frames. And once you're in the folder, uh, click A to go ahead and select every single frame and hit open clip on the top right. Then you can zoom out to see your entire clip. All right, so just so you guys know, in future tutorials, I will have an add-on enabled where you can see what my key presses are, um, but that's only in the 3D view, and right now we're working in motion effects, so you won't have it for this tutorial, but don't worry, in future tutorials, when we get into more complicated stuff, uh, you will be able to see my keystroke. But whatever I do, I will try to tell you. All right, now you notice the colors look just a little bit weird here, and that's because we're not in the right color space that we shot the footage in, which is Rec. 709 in my case and most likely you'll be shooting Rec. 709 too. So to be able to get that uh, color space back properly, we want to go over to here on the right and go to the render settings, which is a little camera icon, and go to the very bottom and choose color management. And then uh, right down here under view transform, you see change that from filmic to standard. And now all your contrast is back. Now filmic is usually good for more uh, 3D animation where you're not doing any type of real footage um, implementation, but for real footage implementation, like 3D compositing, you really want to make sure that is set to standard. Okay, so this is our sort of tracking window in which we will go ahead and track a bunch of little points and then uh, calculate that into a 3D camera solve. Um, so first off, we're going to go ahead and hit prefetch here on the top left, and that will go ahead and just preload our footage so it will play smoothly as we work on editing it. All right, so first off, we want to go ahead and change our project length to the right. So we're going to hit set seam frames, and it's going to go ahead and change the length of the timeline to match our clip. Now, if we hit space to play through here, you can see our clip plays through quite nicely. All right, so I'm going to uh, change up the view of this a bit. I prefer to have on the bottom here just a normal timeline. So to change the view of a window, go ahead and hit the uh, left mode button on the top of the window and go ahead and click timeline. You don't have to do this. This is just the view that I prefer to work in. All right, so now that we have our timeline here, um, what we want to do is go ahead and start tracking points. Um, now, we can go into a huge amount of detail um, in tracking here. There's so, so many settings and Blender really, has a really powerful motion tracking system. I'm going to show you what will work best for this type of shot and probably most shots, um, but you can really start diving into all these little settings. So I really do encourage you experimenting or looking up more specific motion tracking tutorials but this will show you the basics. So let's go ahead and pick a point we want to track. You want to pick points of contrast, whether that be color contrast or preferably lightness contrast. So uh, one of these points on the ground is probably going to be pretty good for starting off. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in here. I think we can go ahead and track this leaf on the ground right here. I will say if you want to do motion tracking, fall is the best time of year because usually leaves on the ground, tons of tracking data. So 
wait till the fall to do this. <laughs> no, don't do that. Okay, so we wanna go ahead and track this leaf. What you wanna do when you track a point is you wanna find the frame that has the most data or most information of that point. So for instance, if we find a frame, there's not a whole lot of motion blur in this shot, but a frame all the way back here in the very beginning, zoom in, there's only, it, it's only taken up a couple pixels. But if we go to a frame at the very end of the video, when the camera is much closer to the leaf, the leaf is larger, so there's more data to track. All right, once we've picked a point to track, we wanna go ahead and add a marker or a tracking point on top of our point. So to do that, you're gonna hold down Command and click, or in Windows, probably the Windows key, and then click. So now you've got this marker which you can move around. Uh, so what we wanna do is make sure that all of the data we want to track is inside this square. So if you hit the S key, you can scale it up and down accordingly. You can also scale it on each axis, uh, X and Y. So if scale wants to just scale in all directions, but if you hit Y after that, you can scale it just vertically or X and just horizontally. And once you like something, you can click it. So I might scale this down to a bit, you know, fit the size of my tracking data a bit more. All right, now before we go ahead and track this, I wanna go ahead and show you something. So go ahead and hold down Alt S and that will bring up a second box. Now, if you've done 2D tracking, this will look very familiar, um, but for those who haven't done that, the way 2D tracking works is this outer box is called the search area and this inner box is called the tracking area. So basically what the computer will do is it will take a frame of video, analyze what's inside this inner box, and then on the next frame, it will scan inside this entire search area and try to find this data. So if we had a search area really, really tiny, uh, after just a slight bit of movement, we're gonna run outside of that search area. So you wanna make sure that search area is large enough so that your computer will be able to find the data it needs to track it. Now, the more motion a clip has, the larger that search area is going to need to be to do successfully, but it's also gonna take longer because it's having to search more pixels. So for something like this, I think a size like that will be perfectly sufficient, but of course we can always change it if it's not working. All right, so now that we have this uh, tracking point set up, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, track our shot. So if you go over to the left here on this left window, we can open the uh, track option. And down here we have all these buttons. So uh, what, what we're gonna be using mostly is under track, we're gonna use this uh, track markers backwards. So that's gonna track any selected markers backwards. So if we go ahead and click that, it's gonna go ahead and seemingly skip around, but what it's really doing is going through and uh, analyzing exactly you know, where that point is going. So we can go ahead and scrub through here and we notice it stopped and it's not at the end of the clip. And that's because uh, the computer was confused and didn't know, you know where it was supposed to go for that point. So it just stopped and basically aired out. But we can see it's right there. So to fix this, when we go to this frame that it doesn't know where it is, we can go ahead and manually click and select it and move it on to where it should be. And then once that's done, we can go ahead and track backwards again or use the shortcut, which is uh, Shift Command T, which will continue to track backwards. Now you can track forwards as well. I'm just doing backwards because uh, that frame, we started at the very end of the clip, so we need to track backwards. But tracking forwards and backwards is the identical process. All right, so here we lost it again. So I'm gonna go ahead and select it and choose again. You see the reason probably why it's losing it is because um, it is really quite transforming shape here from the original, but that's fine. We can go ahead and just move it back and then uh, hit track back again and it lost it again. But this is pretty normal for Blender. Sometimes you'll have to help it along, especially something like this where the shape of the leaf is kind of changing as the camera moves further back. So we're just gonna keep doing this until we've gotten to the end. All right, so now we've reached the end of the clip and as you can see, Blender has um, track this point on. And what you can do is if you hit the L key, any selected markers will be locked onto. So now it's locked in the center of a frame. And this is a great way to sort of see how accurate you're tracked it. So if I zoom in here and play through, you can see that track it's locked to a view frame. And you can see it's actually locked on pretty well for the most part. There is a couple places where it kind of jumped around and we can actually fix that. So when you get to right here, we can see it kind of hops around a little bit. And this might partly be because the camera sort of jerked around. But what we can do is see right here between these two frames, everything is the same and suddenly the track moves to the right. So here we can go ahead and move it back to the left here and then just kind of smooth that transition. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but the higher quality each individual track is will affect the quality of your overall shot. So go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and save my project here because I usually do that after about every track. All right, so now that point is tracked. So now we're gonna go ahead and just do that with a couple other points. So I'll go ahead and show you a couple other examples. Also, if you deselect your point and you can't move it, that's because it's still locked onto that track, but there's nothing selected, so it doesn't really know what to lock onto. So go ahead and hit L to unlock. You can see on the top left here, we can go from locked to, 
to nothing there. So that's a good way to tell that. And then you can move around again. All right, so I'm gonna pick another point here. Let's go to, let's go to like the middle. I think it's gonna be good because that parallax shift can distort the images. So I'm gonna pick another point here. I'm gonna pick the edge of this grass here. Or let's see, I'll, I'll pick this bit of grass right down here. There's lots of tracking options here. And um, you just really wanna experiment at what tracks best, you know? Sometimes uh, on certain shots, um, you'll have points that just don't, flat out don't track very well. Um, you just wanna find those and avoid those, of course, and find the areas that do track really well. So it is really a trial and error, but Blender does a pretty good job of tracking. Um, I usually, the search size default, because it usually does a pretty good job, but if I do see it, losing often, I might increase that a bit. All right, so now I have my point here. I'm gonna go ahead and track forward first. I'm first gonna lock on so I can sort of keep that in the center of my view. Then I'm gonna go ahead and hit track forward. And you can see it went a little ways and didn't track on well. I think I'm gonna need to scale this up a bit more because I think that's just a bit too small. Scale that up a bit. And you can do that in the middle of a track and it will just adjust for it and it won't mess up any previously tracked, um, tracked keyframe. So go ahead and hit track forward again. Move it over to a little bit. It's having a little trouble here because there's so much parallax shifting. Um, but Blender will do most of the heavy lifting for you in this phase, which is great. You might have to do a couple keyframe adjustments here and there, but mo for the most part, Blender does the work for you. So you see it tracked onto that pretty well. And we're gonna go, um, so you can see here it, it kept my uh, scale change between frames, but it kept all the tracking information the same. So now we can go ahead and go back and to where we were before. And I'm gonna hit track backward this time and caught up a little bit. So I'm just gonna go through here and get this tracked. All right, so now that part is tracked. You can see it holds onto there fairly well. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and save that and choose another point. Now, you wanna make sure that all your points aren't in the same general area. The farther apart your points are, generally the more higher quality of a track you will get. And you also wanna make sure that you have a good amount of tracks, or at least one or two, where your actual object will be placed. So that's why I'm kind of doing a lot of tracks here on the asphalt, because that's where my car will be. So it's really important that that area is tracked properly. All right, so let's go ahead and do a track a bit further away from the camera here. So um, over here, I have this, you know, kind of metal black thing over here in the woods. And we're gonna go ahead and track that. So, so I'm gonna go ahead and go to my first frame here, which I think is a fine, uh, frame and I'm gonna go ahead and create a new tracker marker. Now, we could do something like, you know, tracking just the dark area over here, um, but I'm worried about the tree sort of occluding that area. So I think I'm just gonna do this outer area, but of course I wanna go ahead and scale this up a bit more just to give it a bit more information to track. All right, so that looks good. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit track forward, lock that in, in my view, hit track forward, and you can see it tracked up to frame 61 and stopped. Um, but you notice it's even though it's stopped, it still has hasn't lost the track. It's still attached just fine. What it's realized is over the next frame, that area goes outside of the viewport, and it's detected that's you know happening. So it's just stopped the track, which is actually perfectly fine because obviously we can't track outside of our frame. So that's perfectly fine. You don't need a track to go cover your entire length of footage. Um, so you can just get, you know, however long an object is in the view of the camera, track it for however long that is. Now you do need a decent amount of tracks, you know, across your entire footage. They don't have to be the exact same track. You know, you could actually, you know, have a bunch of different tracking markers as long as you have tracking markers covering your entire timeline. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go through and do a bunch of different tracks here. I think I'm gonna do another one on the ground here. Um, I really highly suggest having at least three tracking points on your ground plane that will really help you later on when we're setting up our 3D scene. So I'm gonna go ahead and track this little leaf here. So I'm gonna create a marker, scale it up to what would be appropriate for this, scale on the X, a bit wider there. I'm gonna go ahead and track backwards and then go to that same keyframe where I started and track forwards. And you see it goes out of the frame here and that's totally fine. Now let's say somewhere along our track, the tracking um, got lost. So let's say it went to like here and track that forward and just kind of, you know, didn't track on, well, let's say, I'm just gonna create a really bad example. Let's say that our tracker got completely lost and started tracking the wrong thing and then tracked forward. So here's an example. Now, obviously I did that manually, but sometimes a blender will lose a track just like that. Now, this doesn't happen very often, but if you have an uh, area with a lot of low detail or a lot of grain, this can happen. So if this happens, uh, there are a couple different ways you can go about it. One, you can try to correct it, um, but just by manually, you know, seeing when it hops off to a frame, just, you know, just like we did before, putting it back in its place where it should be. But let's say you do that and it still gets off and it's just not working. What you can actually do 
all this tracking data here is actually all good. It's just after this frame, which it starts failing. What we can do is delete all the tracking data after a certain frame, but keep all the good tracking data. So let's find a frame where it actually gets off. So let's say right there is when it gets off. So I'm gonna go to the previous frame and over here in your tracking settings, uh, below track, we have this little button that says clear and we have a clear back and a clear forward. Um, now, the bad tracking data is in the forward direction, so I'm gonna hit clear forward, and you can see it removed all the tracking data after this particular frame. So now we have this amount of good tracking data for this thing, and then the track just ends, and there's no more data to corrupt your salt. So that can be really useful if you have a track that you only wanna track for you know a specific amount of frames, because after that, it just doesn't track anymore. Um, that can be a way to do this. Now, of course, in this particular track, I'm gonna continue the track because it actually worked perfectly the first time. Um, until it went out of frame. So yeah. All right. So now I'm going to go ahead and just do probably do one more track on here. I might do this little this little leaf thing. This looks like some good track. Scale that up a bit and track that backwards. Nope. <laughs> the track backwards button. You can also track by individual frames if you want to. Um, I don't see the use for that, but you know, if you need to go minutely to make sure that every single frame is uh, tracking properly, you can totally do that. And again, you always want to make sure after track, go ahead and I was just locking it to your view just to make sure everything looks really smooth. And this is why we wanted to have a really smooth shot when we went and shot this footage originally, because you know, the more motion blur we have, the harder it will be to track. So that's why I sort of suggested you stabilize or just really you know, was careful with how you did your cam movement. Now you can track shaky footage. It's just a lot more difficult. And for beginners, it can be a real headache. So that's why I suggested that you did that as smoothly as possible. All right, so I've got a decent amount of tracks here. Towards the end, we only have two and I wanna have at least three on my ground plane at all times. Um, you'll see why later once we set up our tracking scene. So um, I'm gonna find something else to track. Like there's a little leaf here, we can track that. So I'm gonna go ahead and scale that up and track that backwards. All right, so now you can see we have tracked this other point here, and that actually tracked very well throughout the entire timeline. So that's a really good example. So we're gonna save that. I think this post back here is gonna be a really great thing, really high contrast area here. So let's go ahead and uh, select this post, find a nice sharp frame where it's not you know, motion blur, and just go ahead and add a tracker. And I'm gonna go ahead and track backwards. So now we have a track which goes through our entire shot in the background like that. Uh, so yeah, what we wanna do is just go ahead and just add a lot of tracking markers and make sure that they're um, in a very widespread area. So every area of frame um, that's appropriate, you really should have tracking markers. And um, that will just really increase the quality of your track. Now, as far as how many you should add, I would just add as many reasonably successful tracks as you can. And then later on, once we have a lot of tracks, when we go to solve the camera, we can um, you know, get rid of ones that aren't necessarily the most accurate to help increase our overall accuracy of the track. So right now, just do as many as you can successfully on that look, you know, good enough to not be absolute trash. And then later on, we can do a uh, more refinement with the quality of each track. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a bunch of tracks and I'll be right back. Okay, so I've gone ahead and added a bunch of more tracking markers. And so now we've got all these tracking markers tracked all over our scene. Um, if you're having trouble getting your trackers um, tracking, uh, just try to find areas with really high contrast and low motion blur. Um, so for instance, like if I was going to, you know, do some tracks on these trees, I tried to find points that were, you know, really light on really dark, like this track here, you can see this track is really light and really dark. So that'd be a great track. I wouldn't want to just go and, you know, try to track this blob right here. Cause there's not a whole lot of information. It'd be really easy for the track to jump around. Um, so just try to find those points of contrast and Blender does a really good job at actually motion tracking. So you shouldn't have too much trouble. And if you're having to do a bunch of keyframe adjustments throughout the whole thing, it could be not of contrast or your search box might not be big enough. Um, so you might check that too. But search box in generally usually isn't the problem for bad tracks. Okay, so as you can see, I've got a bunch on the ground here where my car will be and some in the and you know some in the background on the left, some in the background on the right. Just try to evenly distribute them across your entire frame. Now notice I haven't put any back here on the road and that's because this road is so, you know, hidden from the parallax change. There isn't really enough time to get a good track. I mean, I could track like this little black part of the gate, but it's only there for a few moments and I have lots of other tracks in those areas, so. I think, honestly, you're totally fine. So um, now let's say you're done with your tracks. Also, you know, you've got things like this in the foreground, really foreground, that's not really with the rest of the scene. If I was gonna try to put something in the tree, you should totally track that. Um, 
but you know, if I'm not doing that right now, and that's just, I think just gonna confuse my track more than help it, so I'm not gonna do that. Okay, so now let's go ahead and do uh, the camera solve feature. Um, so first off, we're gonna go over to the solve tab on the left, and we're just gonna hit this big button to solve camera motion, and just click it. And then up here in the top right, you'll get something called a solve error. Right now, ours is 3.3572. That solve error basically is telling you the accuracy of your camera solve or, you know, camera solve is basically just, you know, figuring out the motion of the camera. So basically your overall motion track, that's the solve error. You want that to be ideally below one and the lower is better. So obviously this is 3.3, so we need to bring that lower. If you get a crazy number like 16 or, you know, 20 or something like that, don't worry, we can bring it down a lot lower um, but again the more time you spend on your tracks and the smoother of a shot you get this um, step will go way easier so if you're having a, this is the step where people get really hung up on usually this step took a long time to master myself as well um, it just takes practice and learning what works and what doesn't and refinement uh, but even if you have a high error don't worry we can fix it with a lot of different techniques first we're gonna go ahead and set up our camera information um, which is over here on the right, you can open camera and we see all this information about our camera. This is by far the thing that will most likely uh, really help you to get a better track. Cause you know, Blender can sort of guess what your sensor size is, focal length, all that stuff like that. Um, but it's really gonna help if you can give it that information if you know it. So try to take note, I probably should have said this in the first part, take note of what focal length you shot it at and um, if you don't know your sensor size you can look it up on Google but also camera um, blender has a bunch of built-in presets so I use a Canon Rebel series which is an APS-C sensor size so if you click on the right here you can click this and open up all these different presets and I have a Canon APS-C so I can click that and it automatically fills in my camera information it seems like nothing happens because you just click it and oh what happened but actually it's filled in all this information about your sensor so do that um, and if you don't know your sensor width just go on um, Google and look it up. And then below that, go to, down to lens and type in the focal length it was shot at. I know this was shot at 18 millimeters, so I'm gonna type that in. All right, now we set up our camera and lens information. I'm gonna save, and I'm gonna go ahead and solve camera motion again. And now we have an error of 1.8, or it might be just lower than what you had before. And obviously we're headed in the right direction, but we wanna get that even lower. What we wanna do is eliminate the lowest quality tracks to increase the overall average track quality. So what we can do here, now if you click on a, just pick a random track, um, this will only happen, by the way, after you do your camera solve. But after you do camera solve, go back to the tracking section and click on track. And on the right, you can open up the track view. And down here below, there'll be a new uh, number called average error. And this will be a number of similar to our solve error, but just for the track specifically. Now you could go through and click every single track and try to find the low ones, or sorry, the high ones, because again, high means lower quality. Um, so zero would be pristine quality. You'll never get that. Um, wouldn't that be a dream? Um, so a faster way to do this is if we can go over to the left and if we go to, is it solve? Yes, under solve, we can go to cleanup and we can actually select tracks that are above a certain error threshold. So what we can do is uh, type in under this error section, we can type in a threshold. I'll, I'll, I'm clicking around a lot of these seem like they're pretty, pretty low errors. So I'm gonna choose something like, you know, two, but um, so just pick a number like that. And then I'm gonna make sure your type is select so we can just see which markers are being selected. And then we're gonna hit, make sure you haven't selected any tracks by the way. And then we're gonna hit clean tracks. And all that will do is select all our tracks that have an error above two. Now, if we get a bunch of tracks like this, you might wanna up that error or something higher. Now, here's the thing. All these tracks, um, these are pretty important tracks. You know, these are some distant object tracks that are all fairly important. Um, so, I probably don't want to eliminate all of them. So I might change this error to maybe 2.5 and see which ones are 2.5. I'm gonna deselect everything, clean tracks. Okay, so just these two tracks right here are two point, okay, there's one down there too. So these are all 2.5. And I know that I could probably do without these because I have other tracks in those areas. So what I'm gonna do is just hit X and then delete them. And I'm gonna go ahead. Now what you could do if you, what I found, it might be best to save you some time is after you get a solve error, um, like after you do a solve, go ahead and save like a backup of the file. So save as and save a duplicate or just duplicate the file and then go in here to try to refine it because sometimes you can actually really mess up your solve and delete a track that may have been really important and suddenly your solve error is super high and you're like, oh my gosh, how do I get it back? And um, if you save since then, you might not be able to just undo it. So it's really, um, if you're having a lot of trouble with a track, 
may, may be a good idea to go ahead and save as a backup. Um, this track isn't giving me any problems, so I'm not really gonna bother doing that. But if you're having problems, saving between every solve is a good idea. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, solve camera motion again after deleting those tracks. Now we have 1.4, that is lower, so that's we're heading in the right direction. Um, so again, I could start eliminating more, but what I'd like to do is increase the quality of my individual tracks rather than necessarily eliminating them because, you know, the more tracking data, the better, but that tracking data does have to be high quality because low quality tracking data, it's gonna hurt you overall. So what I'm gonna do is um, with that, uh, go back to that two and go ahead and select tracks. And I see that, um, you know, they've got these two tracks here which are above solve error of, of two. So I'm gonna go ahead and look at each track individually. I'm gonna start off with this track and I'm gonna see, um, I'm gonna go ahead and lock onto it and just play through it and see what it looks like. So, so far here, all right, I'm seeing some slight drifting going on there. So if you notice right about here, right about these frames right here, there's some drifting just a little bit off to the left there. Um, but it's such a small amount, especially at the end there, that's that's a, right there, there's a bit of a hop, see that? You can see also here on the right, if you open up your track settings, uh, image of just with the track sees, and you can see this should stay relatively the same, but as we go here, you can see suddenly that leaf pops to the right. So what I could even do is before that point, before it pops to the right, I could just uh, clean up or just remove, clear all the tracking data after that. Oop, not that way. Tracking everything before it and save it. And uh, now that track air, average error when we solve again should be better. Um, now you could go through each individual track and see which things hop around, but actually there's a really useful tool built into Blender called a graph you know what a graph is, but we can actually display all of our tracking information in graph form. And that can be super helpful with figuring out which tracks aren't really the best. So um, up here in this top window, we have this saying, it's called it right now we're in the dope sheet view, which is basically listing a bunch of keyframes. We don't really need to mess with that. What we want to do is go up here and change from dope sheet to graph. Then we get this big old thing, which is, can be kind of confusing. Um, what I want to do is I want to kind of compress everything together so it's not so vertically high. So over here on the right, I, you can take your um, sliders here and take these dots and sort of bring them down and stretch it out. And then when we zoom in, we can sort of bring everything together, mostly like that, into view. So what I want to do is I want to look through this track, and this is basically showing all the motion of every single track. And if I select a track, you can see that motion gets highlighted there on this thing. So what I wanna do is go through um, and look for any lines that don't seem to line up with the rest. So for instance, right here, you can see there's this track right here is going and then it hops down when everything else is going up. So that's not right, there's this little hop here. So if we zoom in on the track, we can see there's it's probably hopping around, I'm guessing. So if we go there, we can sort of see on this frame right there, it kinda hops out of the way. Um, so you could just select that frame and just try to adjust it and actually you can see real-time adjustments here of the X and the Y of how it's adjusting. So you can try to, you know, adjust things and try to get it looking similar to other things and that's sort of a good way to look at it. But in real life, you know, those different points will be different. It's None of them should really line up exactly on top of each other, but that can be a good way to refine it. But you know, that can take a while. So it might be better just to select the tracks that have a lot of, you know, a lot of random spikes like that and just delete the track because that means it's probably a low quality track after that. Okay, so here's an example. Apparently that this is showing like the overall velocity, I guess, of the track. And if that track ends, it's gonna have a big spike like that at the end of the track. So maybe if you see those, it might be best to ignore those. <laughs> Learn something new every time you do these tutorials. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of look around and look for things that are really out. Now, if you see something that's, you know, the same shape, just in a different location, that's totally fine. That shouldn't raise anything. because, you know, it's actually a different place in 3D space, so it should be different. So you can look over here. This is actually a really good clean track. If you see a, a track you're having trouble with, you'll see a lot of deviation, and you wanna make sure everything's going together. So this is, this is an example of where everything's going pretty much together. So there's not a whole lot of track refinement I can do after this, but I wanna get that number below one. So I think what I will do is just go ahead and start eliminating tracks that are above an error of two. So I'm gonna go over here to clean up, clean tracks. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete those tracks. And now I'm gonna go ahead and solve for again, see if we get lower. All right, now we have 1.2, that is good, um, but we can do better. So I'm gonna go ahead, just a 1.8 solve error and clean those tracks. All right, so we only have, looks like we only have one. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna delete track and solve. And every time you change something, you wanna solve and just to make sure what you're doing is enhancing it. And if suddenly you're, that way you know, if you do something and suddenly it, the error spikes, you know, oh, shouldn't have done that. You can undo it. 
Um, all right, so now we got 1.08, and that's actually, that's totally usable. I'm gonna keep refining, I'm gonna see how low we can get this thing, because I have a lot of tracks. This is why you wanna have a lot of tracks more than you would think you'd need, because you know, you never know, some of them might do better than others, so you wanna be able to have that leeway room to eliminate tracks, so try 1.2, see if there's any above that. All right, there's a couple above 1.2. Those are, okay, those are seemingly unimportant, so I'm gonna go ahead and just delete them hesitantly and see if that helps. Okay, see, right there, our solver spiked to 13. Now, I'm gonna undo, first of all, Phew, that's a good reason why you should save backups, because if something like that happens and for some reason you can't undo it, now you're back at the venue, you gotta, you gotta retract whatever and try to remember what those points were. Um, and I think the reason why that happened is throughout your entire track, you need to have a minimum of, I believe it's eight tracks always active at any given frame um, for the solving to work properly. And you know, I might have eliminated enough tracks where it had like maybe only seven or six tracks and suddenly it's, oh, I need those full eight so it's not gonna work. So that can happen. But 1.0 is perfectly fine. Honestly, I've gotten away before using like even something as high as two or three if it's not a huge movement. Um, something like this is a fairly large movement, so I probably would want to get as low as possible, but just get whatever low you can. And um, if you're really having trouble, um, go ahead and just maybe try reshooting it or just try it again and just try to make each track as high quality as possible. Um, and yeah, so just a lot of it has to depend on the quality of the original footage really. All right, so now this is gonna be the end of this tutorial. Um, in the next part, we're going to take all this camera tracking information and uh, apply it to a um, virtual camera in 3D space and set up our scene for 3D compositing. Um, so if you have any questions about how this works or things you wish I covered, please let me know down in the comments. I do read every one. And if you have a pertinent question, I'll probably respond or someone else who may know more than me and watch this video might respond too. So. Um, there's a lot of good information if you really want to dive more into the settings of motion tracking, which I really highly recommend if you really want to get into visual effects. I'm kind of doing this as sort of overview, um, but there's so many settings you can go in here to really help refine refine your track. So um, yeah, have fun. <laughs> tracking can be kind of a hard process sometimes, but it's really required if you want to do any type of um, realistic 3D compositing. Well, my light is slowly dying here, so I better wrap this up. I'm Josiah, thanks for watching. Okay, cool. So save that and come back to it later.